or kids that just um, were repeat, repeat offenders. offenders, I guess, you know, I would call them different terms, but um, what would you call them? I, I, I don't necessarily even like using the word offenders and it's like a, a whole different terminology for kids that we don't even say it's criminal. It's more like, you know, behavior that would be criminal conduct if, because it's just sort of this movement to like, not like, um, criminalize kids, but sometimes it's a bit counterintuitive because maybe it's the behavior that's really at issue and not how the adults in charge respond to it, which was sort of a, um, a rub for me in my later years, actually, of working, working in the juvenile justice system because fewer and fewer kids were even um, going through the system, not because they weren't engaging in the same kind of criminal conduct, but because sort of the, the trend... Um, based upon studies and, you know, evidence-based research, um, that it was better to not immerse them in the system, uh, maybe because you might expose one child to a more serious offender, and you know, and, um, but it was a little problematic in my mind that kids might, you know, engage in criminal conduct, and then nothing would happen, because they might not be having any sort of consequences. Yeah, there the are no home, repercussions for the no actions. Repercussions, nothing. The school's hands are tied. Oftentimes, you know. That's going to be hard working with juveniles, doing that and prosecuting those cases. Um. Yeah, a lot of it was hard. I mean, there was a lot of you know tragedy and trauma. You know that you're exposed to just mm-hmm. being in the system, and the court really would delve into the the lives of the juvenile. And um, so we learned a lot about, you know, who their care providers were or weren't and, um, you know, abuse history, substance abuse, um, you know, whether their parents might be incarcerated, uh, maybe their parents, you know, were deceased, a lot, a lot of tragedy that's Mm -hmm. in the lives of some of these young folks. Not all, you know, there were some offenders that just made bad mistakes and they're, you know, just and had pretty, you know, healthy home environments, you know, that happens, of course, as well. Um, But it was just a really great opportunity to sort of see the reality of the challenges that a lot of people face and to be able to take those into consideration and figuring out how to address these circumstances to help prevent, you know, the criminal conduct from occurring again enhancing public safety and also, you know, get the kid on the right track, get them in school. Um, you know, when I <laughs> grew up here, I thought like, um, continuation school and when kids got in trouble that, you know, oh my gosh, they must be having to go to school like at 6 a.m. until like 9 p.m. or something crazy like that because yeah. they're really in for it now. And and then I learned it was quite the opposite. You know, it's like the, the schools weren't able to address their behaviors and so it sort of resulted in the kids having absolutely no supervision and potentially being out, out on the streets and are a lot of those kids when they get into the system like that do they end up being repeat offenders so it's one crime and then it leads down that that path of just continuation um i i don't know exactly that i would say a lot but certainly there were uh young people that graduated into the adult system and you know some of the crimes were also very serious, just as serious as a, adult offenders in terms of the underlying conduct. I mean, my first homicide was a uh, two young men that killed a homeless man. And, oh, wow. Um, so, you know, and I also had a number of um, sexual assault, sexual molestation cases. So older kids um, sexually assaulting uh, younger children. Uh, most of my trials that I remember that I had uh, in juvenile court Many of them involve sexual assault um, allegations and charges. Also, I had a lot of, you know, like fights at school or, you know, kind of um, assault with a deadly weapon type cases, burglaries, things like that. But the um, child molestation charges and uh, those those happen. And oftentimes those are more contested. And so it, it makes a lot of sense that those would be the ones that would go to trial. But That is not what I was... That's not what came to mind when you said juvenile cases. I was thinking petty theft or fights or, you know, these smaller crimes. You don't think of homicide and and sexual assault as, as fitting in to, you know, kids committing these crimes. Right, right. Uh, so all of the um, cases that um, a law enforcement officer would write a report on, those first go to the juvenile probation department. 
And then they would go from there uh, to the district attorney's office, and I would then review them. And so there was this whole filtering process. So officers out on the street might use some degree of discretion in, in terms of how they handle the, the incident. And then uh, if it's a little more, you know, higher level of seriousness, then it might go to the probation department. And then they have a lot, of, they had a lot of discretion as well in terms of what charges they would then refer to uh, the district attorney's office. So what ended up on my desk was typically the more serious offenses or kids that just um, were Repeat, repeat offenders. offenders, I guess, you know, I would call them different terms, but, um, what would you call them? I, I, I don't necessarily even like using the word offenders and it's like a, a whole different terminology for kids. That we don't even say it's criminal. It's more like, you know, behavior that would be criminal conduct if, because it's just sort of this movement to like, not like, um, criminalize kids, but sometimes it's a bit counter intuitive because maybe it's the behavior that's really at issue and not how the adults in charge respond to it, which was sort of a, um, a rub for me in my later years, actually, of working, working in the juvenile justice system because fewer and fewer kids were even um, going through the system, not because they weren't engaging in the same kind of criminal conduct, but because sort of the, the trend... Um, based upon studies and, you know, evidence-based research, um, that it was better to not immerse them in the system, uh, maybe because you might expose one child to a more serious offender and, you know, and, um, but it was a little problematic in my mind that kids might, you know, engage in criminal conduct and then nothing would happen because they might not be having any sort of consequences. Yeah, there are the no home, repercussions for the no actions. Repercussions, nothing. The school's hands are tied, oftentimes, you know, and and so, I think accountability is really important, and I think consistency is really important. I think those concepts certainly are um, applicable to helping our youth, you know, find boundaries and sort of help them understand, you know, our social norms and you know how we can respect one another. Basically, mm-hmm. you know, has that continued that decline in you know, wanting to use this safe language around juveniles and not wanting them to go into the system, depending on the crime, or has that continued or furthered, I guess, or has there been pushback on that? Um, It's continued, I would say, probably even further. So um, when I first started in the juvenile justice program, there was the California Youth Authority, which was basically prison for kids. And so it had, you know, that would be like juvenile hall. It, right. Well, or, uh, it's more so. Juvenile hall would be the equivalent of like the county jail. Okay. So, um, but kids wouldn't be there in theory for a long term period. Um, but California Youth Authority was uh, for all counties um, of juvenile offenders for like the more serious offenders or uh, offenders where all of the county resources had been exhausted. So the county had tried to address the the behavior of the youth, try to provide services, whatever intervention the county might have available to them. And if that didn't prove to help the child change their behavior, then they might ultimately uh, be committed to the California Youth Authority. Okay. And or back in the day, uh, it might have been because of the underlying offense. So homicide, if they... If they weren't tried as an adult, then maybe they would uh, be committed to California Youth Authority or under some circumstance. It gets complicated. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so I'll stop. No, but, no, no. It's, um, it's interesting hearing that that thought process, right? Because there's really two camps. The camp of, you know, you need to hold these kids accountable so that they don't think that these actions are okay, right? You continue down that path. But you also, you almost want to take into account that they're just kids. And sometimes you're a product of your environment. You don't want to ruin a kid's life because of a mistake they might have made when they were 13 or 14. Right, right. And I think that um, maybe the better approach is taking all of those concepts together, you know. And and so, but, you know, back to like kind of the, the trend. So I did have the California Youth Authority then. There were things that happened there that you know were objectionable and and there were lawsuits and there were a lot of changes that were made and a lot of reform within that system and you know fast forward to where we're at today basically the california youth authority that it then changed its um, name to division of juvenile justice i think it's top of my head i might have that wrong djj but um it's now essentially closing so so 
that's no longer an option for uh, counties where, it, and, and it can be particularly challenging for the more rural, smaller counties where there's limited resources, but maybe just as serious of offenders um, in terms of how they can help you know, wrap around those services. So now it's been transitioned, so it's back to the counties having the um, ultimate responsibility for uh, juvenile offenders. And the laws have also changed as well, um, reducing the amount of discretion in situations where the district attorney's office can file on juvenile offenders and treat them as if they were adults. So that's um, extremely limited and much uh, lower possibility, and basically it's always going to be up to the, to oversimplify it, now totally be in the hands of the court if we petition them and if certain circumstances um, apply, so age and type of I was going to say, is that an age risk? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And severity mm-hmm. of crime and things mm-hmm. like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very small um, group of um, juveniles that potentially could even be eligible for those types of commitments. And again, it's no longer a state um operated facility. It's up to the court for to decide things to, like that. Yeah, the court f- to decide and then uh there won't be the, you know, prison for kids that's mm-hmm. just gone, basically is is what's happening. Um does that result in longer stays at So juvenile sit, hall juvenile will hall become yes yeah, so, like so the county has to and the county's been working on that, and the probation department really um, to have the appropriate um, services and sort of a um, program that would be available to offenders that historically would have been sent, um, you know, to the California Youth Authority years ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's it's a um, whole different um, process and and. At the end of the day, always kind of keeping the offenders local is, is what's happening. Have you noticed more juveniles are inclined to offend again because now there's not that next tier of, okay, we're going to send you th- to this place because your actions are indicative that this is becoming a pattern? Yeah. So that's a really good question that I don't know the answer to, mm-hmm. like whether the actual, uh, you know, type of conduct that we would call crimes if they were adults, um, whether that's increased in light of the the different type of a response by the probation department. And I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, what I do know is like from my experience and when I was doing the juvenile uh, justice cases is that um, even though I was the one that was, you know, we need to have consequences here. You violated your term of probation or, you know, you, I expect X, Y, and Z to happen. And even if I was saying um, to the juvenile offenders, like, okay, we're going to give you a chance. You can, you know, um, return home on house arrest rather than spend another, you know, four weeks at juvenile hall. This is just for example. Mm-hmm. And um, But if you violate your terms again, I'm going to ask for that four weeks at juvenile hall the next time you come back. And I, I would make note of that, and I would follow through. Likewise, so if the kid did violate, I would ask for the four weeks in juvenile hall. But if the if the child did not, you know, and they did well, I was more than happy to, to commend them for that as, as well. So, and I would get feedback oftentimes uh, because I was there for so long. They really appreciated, like, the consistency. And they knew what I was going to say, you know, and the kids would kind of peek over, you know. <laughs> and, um and I have um, long-lasting relationships with a lot of the defense attorneys that also worked in the juvenile justice system and the probation officers. And and so we kind of all knew what our roles were and worked together for that common goal of trying to serve the best interests of the, of the juvenile. And, you know, and then I, have, of course, have to look out for the protection of the community and mm-hmm. ensure that the victims have a voice.